224. not be number 170, 170. Good evening, brethren. Good to see everybody. If you would be opening your Bibles, if you care to, to Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, most of the material that we uh, will be going over will be on the screens. But Ezekiel chapter 1, I cut those lights off. There's uh, some intricate things tonight I'd like for you to look at with me. And I'm afraid you won't be able to see them very well, uh, but we'll, we'll go from that. We're looking at uh, Yesekiel. <laughs> that is uh, Ezekiel's Hebrew name. And, of course, Ezekiel's probably one of the most overlooked Bible books, as we talked about last week. And it's apocalyptic symbolism that gives it, I think, such a, a rough time. And as a matter of fact, when you hit chapter 1, you're like, whoa. We are here. There's no <laughs> introduction into uh, apocalyptic symbolism. You are there. And what I want us to try to understand is why apocalyptic symbolism is even used. Chapter 1, you're going to see, is meant to blow you away. It is meant to grab your attention and for you to try to see something that Ezekiel himself is having a very hard time explaining. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look. Why apocalyptic symbolism? Well, first of all, Let's remind ourselves of the perfect nature of God. God has given us his will through revelation. As a matter of fact, the very word revelation itself is where we get our word apocalyptic. Apocalypsis means a revealing or revelation, an opening. In other words, to see something is how the book of Revelation would describe itself. So revealing of information. Remind ourselves of the perfect nature of God. God knows best. And so some of the things that Ezekiel is going to be trying to talk about tonight and trying to show us is some of the same problems that John runs into when he's trying to explain that to which is just about basically unexplainable. And what do I mean about that? Human terms cannot fully convey his glory. The phrase word of the Lord, though, Ezekiel wants you to know this is God's word. Sixty times in the 48 chapters that make up this book, Ezekiel is going to refer to the word of God. This is not me coming up with something. This is not just me trying to give my best shot at something. He's saying these are the words of God. And so with that in mind, I'd like for you to take a look. This is what's called the Hebrew Shema. And basically, Shema just means to hear. That's the very first word you see there. 
But I want you to know that little dot on the front of what looks like a W, uh, the way, of course, I'm reading it backwards, aren't I? Uh, start from over yonder and read it backwards. And you see that first letter there? It looks like a W. That's how they read. They read from right to left, backwards to us. The back of the book is the front of the book for them. You notice that, uh, that W there has a little dot on one side on the right, farthest right uh, leg of that, what we would look like is a W, which is actually the, uh, that's, that gives it the SH sound, where if that dot was on the other side, on the last leg, it would be the S sound. And the reason I tell you that is because that's for us Gentiles. They have what's called vowel pointings, and if you'll see all those little funny looking things under the letters, like a T, a couple of dots under one, under that yod there, uh, you'll see a dot. They added those in about 600 or to 1,000 uh, A.D. We don't really know. But they did that so they wouldn't lose the pronunciation of their language. Because as you can see, the third word there, and see I'm doing this backwards. Let's play like it's English. The first word there, that is God's name. That is va h, uh, v, uh, excuse me, yod h, vav h, and that's uh, God's name. They pronounce that Adonai. Notice in that very first word from the left, if we're reading it in English, like, there's no dots under it. And that's because they said, we don't even pronounce this. And that's when you get to that, you read it from right to left, from right to left, that Shema Israel. And what they would say there when they get to that name of God is Adonai. They wouldn't even try to pronounce that. And I want you to see those vowel points because I want to show you something that I believe that's very interesting. Here is the very first uh, verse in the Bible. And that first word is Beroshith. Now, the root word there is those three letters that are underlined. That is Rosh. It means head or arc or the top. But why I'm drawing your attention to this is that first letter right there. In the Hebrew language, they put things at the beginning. That's where they put their prepositions in, for, against, to, with, by. All those things that we use separate. They stick it onto the word. And I think they just do that to make it harder for me. But on the end, that little funny uh, yod and, uh, well, the last two letters of that, that that's how they, they congregate, conjugate their verbs. That's like in Latin, just like in uh, Spanish. Uh, it tells you whether it's male, female, plural, and so forth. But I want you to see that right there because we're going to see that a lot with a, with a key. And the key is the like, like, the, the like preposition. But, and we're going to see that a lot. And I just thought while we had this up here, I'd also show you, these. see these things right here in front of these words? Those are what's called the definite article in Hebrew. We use the word the. The definite article is for us is the. Greek has a bunch of definite articles, but the Hebrews, they stick it right on the front of the word. Sometimes it's a question. And so it's a very interesting language to, to, to learn. But that's their word for the. But I want you to see that. And one of the reasons I want you to see that is because of what we find and we're going to use Ezekiel chapter 1 at verse 13. Can you see that cursor moving right there? Can you see that? Because it was kind of tough earlier for me looking at the screen. I realize that's kind of hard to see. But do you see this little, looks like a backward C connected to the front of this word? That is the Hebrew uh, uh, inseparable preposition for as or like. And I wanted you to see that. I want you to see I'm just not making it up. That's in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 13. The interesting thing about this, for instance, let's go ahead and take a look. This word itself is mara, mara, and it means appearance. It's how something looks, okay? And so he's using the word appearance there, but he sticks. Notice how that begins with that funny-looking thing right there? Okay, now let's go back and look at it. Here uh, is that word we were just looking at. That's the first letter of the real word, but notice this is stuck on the front of it. That is the inseparable preposition like. That appears 18 times in chapter 1. 18 times in chapter 1, Ezekiel is going to say, and it appears like. And what he's saying there is, I've never seen nothing like this. But here's what I think it looks like. It, it's like this. And so you see words like, and this right here is a word that's going to appear over and over. He's saying this is the appearance. It appeared like this. This is what it appeared as because he doesn't really have anything concrete to give you to say, okay, you've seen a cherubim before? How many of us have seen cherubims? How many of us have seen angels? Well, there's nothing to compare it to. So he's saying, hey, look, this is what it looked like to me. 
He's, and he's able to use his vernacular. You know, that's one of the things that you notice with the prophets, with each Bible writer, is that uh, Micah, for instance, his Hebrew, his uh, training was not as articulate as Isaiah. So they're able to keep that in their vernacular as they write. And you can see some of the things that the less educated men would do than those that were more educated. For instance, Luke's Greek is over the top. It is perfect. Whereas Peter's is kind of rough, kind of gruff. And uh, John's is plain simplistic. And the Bible is inspired of God, no doubt about it. God was speaking through these men, but they were allowed to keep some of their characteristics, if you will, in the penmanship that they gave. And so you can see characteristics of how they wrote different than some other men wrote. I just wanted to share that with you. I hope that didn't uh, uh, throw us off too bad. But I wanted you to see that what we're looking at is Ezekiel trying to do something that's pretty tough. Trying to do something pretty hard. And a lot of people will hit. They're pretty cool to, to verse 4. You know, they go, okay, chapter 1, verse 1, I'm good with that. I understand that too. I'm all over it. 3, it's good. 4, like, whoa. And then going through the rest of that chapter, what in the world is Ezekiel talking about? One of the things that I want us to see is that chapters 1, 2, and 3 are pretty much just Ezekiel's calling. God saying, hey, I've got some preaching for you to do. But chapter 1 is important because for the Israel, where are they wanting to be? They're in Babylonian captivity right now. Where do they want to be? Israel, and particularly Jerusalem. They want to be at the capital city. They have been deported from that. And they think, why do they want to be there so bad? Why is it so significant? Why does Daniel throw open his windows every day and pray towards Jerusalem? Well, what do they associate that with? The very presence of who? God. And now guess what? We're going to be in a river a thousand miles away or 500, whatever it is, as a crow flies. But, you know, you'd have to go across the Fertile Crescent. But we're going to be there, and Ezekiel's going to be standing on foreign soil, and guess who comes to call him? That's right, the very glory and appearance of God. And it's important to understand that because all the things that we're going to be talking about here, this is made to get your attention. This is God in all his glory described, and it's an attention getter. Chapter 2 and 3 will calm down a little bit, and we'll be able to understand that and put it that's more how do you say, literal, uh, and one of the things we learned right off of this, this is a symbolic book, it's full of apocalyptic language, and that we're going to have to pick up on that pretty quick, and so notice, number one, difficult task lay ahead of Ezekiel, for the first part of his ministry, he's going to have to tell everybody, look, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, I know you don't think that's going to happen, I know you're, uh, you're against that, he's going to be very unpopular. And don't you know that many times during the course of when God's laying him, having him lay on one side over a year and playing with those toy soldiers and burning his hair and cutting up part of his hair with a sword and so forth, don't you know that people are going to ridicule him, give him a hard time? And I think this would have been great to keep in his memory to think, okay, God told me this. I saw the very presence of God. Number two, people in Old Testament times believed that the gods of conquering nations were greater than their own and would worship them. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, conquering armies would capture the little gods, and by that I mean statues and stuff, and they would take them home and put them in their God's temple and say, see, our God's superior, here's all the gods that got whooped. And so they would show that. It's, it's amazing that Israel, time and time again, was the exception. Because what was Jehovah God doing? He was conquering everybody. God's the most powerful. He is the only God. And yet, what would Israel do? They would go out and start trying to worship these pagan gods, these false gods. Absolutely amazing. Let's begin with verse 1 of Ezekiel 1. Now, it came to pass in the 30th year, probably referring to Ezekiel's age. Now, you'll read a lot of different scholars that try to do some different stuff here. But I think it's probably talking about his age due to the fact that Ezekiel is going to be a priest. He is a priest by lineage. He is from a family of priests. And at the age of 30, priests began their career. They were not allowed to serve in the temple before their 30th year. So here Ezekiel is 30 years old. If he were back in Jerusalem, it would be time for him to go to work. He'd have to work till he is 50, at which time he would retire. But now it's time for him to go to work. God's going to call him in a foreign land. He doesn't have a temple to go to, uh, but he is going to have a work and have a ministry. In the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, probably sometime in July, 
He says, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, or Chibar. We don't know where that is. Got an idea? Some folks, uh, you know, but it's highly argued, doesn't really matter. It's an area over in Babylon where the Jews were held captive. But when we think of captivity, I think a lot of times we think like Andersonville, you know, the prison down there where they kept the uh, uh, Union uh, soldiers, uh, the Confederacy did. Or we think of uh, the jail or something. This was more like uh, the, the Jews were allowed to come and go. Uh, they could even visit home. And people from Jerusalem could come visit them. And so, see, that was one of the problems that Ezekiel ran into was these people from Jerusalem would come and say, hey, man, everything's great. King Zedekiah is rocking and rolling. You know, things are doing well. Uh, and so people in Babylon were going, man, this, this doesn't look good. I don't, I don't believe we're gonna get, it's going to be destroyed. I think Ezekiel's pulling our leg, so to speak. And so he had a tough time selling that to everybody. The whole time, God's saying it's going to happen. Ezekiel's saying that, but they're getting word from home. Well, maybe that's not so tough. And then some, you have some Jews that will go back and visit and come back and say, you know, everything seems to be going just hunky-dory. Notice how he also dates this. He says that uh, by the river Ch Kibar, that the heavens were opened up and I saw visions of God. Now realize that's a vision. Verse 2. He, he gets this down, but notice how he dates it. In the fifth day of the month, which was the year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Notice he refers to him as king. You see, the captives and a lot of your, I guess you'd call remnant or those that were, um, how would you say, really concerned with uh, what God would have them to do as far as the, the kingship and everything, they didn't really look at Zedekiah as being a king because do you remember who put him there? Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim, who was the rightful king, David's line, that's who was supposed to be there, took him and put Zedekiah in his state. So a lot of folks never really looked at, you, you know, the folks that would really be Hebraish, I guess you could say, the Hebrews of Hebrews, they still looked at Jehoiachin as being the king. So he dates this from the fifth year that Jehoiakim has been uh, held in, uh, in, uh, in Babylon. Verse 3 says, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. I want you to know this is God speaking. And that's that, notice that all caps, Lord there. That's Adonai. It's God's covenant name. This came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi. In the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Notice where we are. I wish this was kind of color-coded a little bit because you couldn't just take off from Israel right there and drive straight across to Babylon. There was a huge desert there. And so in order to get there, you would have to go north along the Mediterranean and then cross over in what's called the, the Fertile Crescent. But they're a long ways from home. And this is where he's receiving his revelation. At home in Israel and Jerusalem, Jeremiah will be working at this time. But over here in Babylon, it's going to be Ezekiel as well as Daniel. Daniel is in Babylon as well. Verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. You ever seen a storm coming? And those clouds as they roll in? I mean, you can see it coming. And it can be a frightful and a scary thing. And this is what Ezekiel is taking. I know this picture doesn't real good because you have all those city lights down there. But here the idea is this, this great force is coming across. And it's a scary thing. This is made to get your attention. He's on this river, you know, and here out in the middle of the desert you can see forever. You know, everything's kind of flat. And lo and behold, here comes this, this force, if you will. Verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now that reminds you a lot of uh, some things we saw in Daniel. And we're going to see some of the same characteristics that we saw of those beasts and that statue in the book of Daniel. Now, uh, a lot of times these are, you know, uh, attributes. Uh, in Daniel, we'll see that they're particular governments and so forth. Here, these are servants of God. They're going to be associated with God. So likeness of four living creatures, as this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. Notice this. Now, this is just an artist's idea of what it could have been like. But they're going to have four different likenesses and almost like each way they could turn, you could see a, a different image. Notice verse 6, and every one had four faces, and every one of these that he sees has four wings. 
And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Now, do you see why he uses the word appeared and likeness? I mean, whatever he's seeing here is some pretty strange looking stuff. Something me and you probably haven't never laid eyes on. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And that'd surprise you, wouldn't you? You'd think of a claw or something of a bird. But here, I mean, the whole thing is just, it's, it's something totally different. And four, and excuse me, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. In other words, it seemed as though they were kind of floating as they went. They didn't just, you know, take off to the right and go, but just kind of moved to the right and so forth. Uh, very interesting. Verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four, excuse me, face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Strange looking indeed. But if we can see those different representations. What's an ox known for? Strength, power. What is an eagle known for? It's swiftness, it's ability to, you know, launch upon its prey and so forth. Uh, what about a man? Uh, intelligence. Intelligence in a calf, a, a, labor, a, a beast of labor. Verse 11, thus where their faces and their wings were stretched upward, two wings of every one were joined, one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward, whether the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. In other words, they didn't about face and go this way, but it's like they were hovering, if you will. Verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Well, now, you've, uh, you've watched those embers in a fire burn, and how they'll, like, they'll like change colors on you. And it looks like it's living and breathing. That's what he says their appearance was like. Like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. So throw that on top of this. It's an amazing thing that he's trying to describe here. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Apparently there was things on these that would go to and from. Verse, uh, chapter 10 at verse 20, I believe Ezekiel tells us what these are. He says, this is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar. And I knew that they were what? Cherubims. Cherubims. Cherubim, the basic idea of a cherub, cherub is fire. And so this is something spectacular. That, I mean, we know them as angels, as those that stand in the presence of God, but the root word there is fire. It's cherubs. They burn, if you will. That's the, and this whole thing is, I have no idea what he's looking at. I know this is him trying to describe a cherubim. And I know that it's like on fire. It's glowing. There's this tremendous lightning coming from these things. It's, this is awesome. If we had computer-generated graphics and could do some of the things they're doing nowadays, just awesomeness would be written over this. Almost speechless. How would you describe something? Something that just make you bow at your knees and go like, look, I can't run. Uh, it wouldn't do me any good to stand up and fight. This is something more spectacular than I have ever laid eyes on. Continuing in verse 15, says, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Now this is where it gets interesting. Boy, these wheels... Everybody and their brothers drawed them at one time or another. It's like one would turn within another, and they would not turn directions, but they would go to and fro. And boy, the people with the UFOs, they go crazy with this right here, and you get all these cylinders and stuff. Uh, look that up sometime, Ezekiel's wheels, and, uh, and your Google, and be amazed at all the different things you'll see. It says, The appearance of the wheels and their work was likened to a color of burl. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. Verse 19, And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels lifted up. So it was like it was a part of uh, these four creatures as well. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature 
was in the wheels. Kind of get the idea, maybe some of the Spirit of God. When those went, these went. When those stood, they stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures. Now he's talking about that above them. Was as the color of terrible crystal stretched forth above their heads. Now, people have tried to put forth uh, descriptions of what they think it might have somewhat looked like, but you can imagine, this is supposed to be Ezekiel standing there, looking at these creatures with all these different faces and the wheels by which they would move, and this whole thing is, is uh, on top of this is, is the glory of God. We ain't even got to the throne yet. He's going to get to that here in a minute. But above that's this beautiful purple-like uh, firmament. The whole thing is just, and brethren, whatever you do, don't lose sight of the just awesomeness of this. This is God getting Ezekiel's attention like nobody else. And Isaiah is going to get a heaven shot, but it's nothing as descriptive. We have no, this is by far the most detailed calling of a prophet in all of the Bible. And we're getting to see inside of heaven, if you will, at what God looks like and what is around him. And the whole thing, if you don't get anything else out of this, is just think of, I don't even know if it's really a word, but awesomeness. I mean, it's over the top. Anything that you can think of, this is greater. This is, this is huge. It's, it's beyond uh, belief, as, you know, if you will. And other the firmament with their wing, or excuse me, were their wings straight. And one toward the other. Everyone had two which covered his side and had two which covered the sides of their bodies. But they had the two, of course, that were out. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters. Now listen to how he describes that. It's like a, you ever been next to a huge waterfall? He says, that's what it sounded like. But notice all the, like the noise of great waters. And in the appearance, I mean, here again, I, th th it didn't really sound like water, but what, how else would you describe it? He says it was powerful. It, it, they made this noise that was like uh, the noise of great waters, you know, similar in that the strength of it and the power of it and how you had to like yell over it so somebody could hear you. As the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host, when they stood, they let down their wings. Now look at the description he just made of what he's hearing. It's like great water, voice of the Almighty, it's like the voice of speech, and it's like the noise of an host when they stood. I mean, it, it, all those different descriptions, he is trying to explain to you what it sounded like. And remember what Paul said about it? When he got to go into the third heaven, he said, I can't even tell you. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. Paul doesn't even talk about what he saw. He just talks about the words that he heard, that it was unlawful. So whatever you get, if you don't get anything else from this chapter, this lesson, just know that we serve a God who is all-powerful, who is into everything, knows all, can see all, and is above all. And uh, when they stood, they let down their wings. Verse 25. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Notice that likeness. It's an appearance of it. It's, it's not like uh, any throne you've ever seen before. But how else would you describe it? Ezekiel says it, it's like a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness of an appearance of a man above upon it. And, uh, you know, many artists have tried to, to render that. I mean, how do you put, you know, into pictures? I appreciate people doing that. At least I get some idea of what they thought it was like. I'll never forget the first time uh, me and the teenage class over at Cold Springs years ago. One of the first things I did with them, we assembled a uh, tabernacle. I mean, a true scale, like one to 30 second tabernacle. And uh, to be honest with you, I had no idea what the tabernacle looked like before we had done that. I mean, I had read those descriptions, but to actually see it portrayed out and to get an idea and to see, okay, so that's what that's talking about. And this is how big this was. And, uh, you know, so that's why I appreciate pictures. That's why I like to use them. Maybe this is probably not as ac very accurate, but at least it's an idea of what somebody thought it looked like. And so when you put it all together, you get this, this bigger picture. Verse 27, and I saw the color of amber as the appearance of a fire round about within it. And he's talking about the throne. From the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. Do you, do you get, you get a, a, a appearance, appearance, appearance? Do you see that? Redundancy? It appears, it's like. I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire 
and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, you know, the greatness and the beauty of it, so was the appearance of the brightness. And these are all great things because we're going to see them later. In the book of Revelation, you're going to see a lot of this described in chapters 4 and 5. When we get a chance to go into the very throne room of God, we're going to see these different colored stone uh, descriptions of the colors. We're going to see the bow that's above God. We're going to hear descriptions of God. And a lot like what you hear here. And when I saw it, he says, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that spake. Finally, boom, here is the presence of God, if you will. We're not in Jerusalem. Where are we? We're a long way over in Babylon. And God has come over here to call Ezekiel. And one of the first things that would have surprised the Israelites or people from Hebrews was that he was here? You mean God appeared to you here, over here in this, this pagan land? Uh, God's presence is, no. As we're going to see in the book of Ezekiel, we'll actually see God's uh, appearance, the God, the, uh, uh, God leave Jerusalem. That's the idea here. God doesn't love his town just because it's where it's located. God loves people and people that worship him. And just like the church today, God is, is everywhere that his church is. And one of the things he's going to show in the book of Ezekiel and what he, what he tells Jeremiah to tell him in the Jeremiah Temple Sermon early on in the book of Jeremiah is that you think this, this city is why you're here? You think this temple is why you're here? You, you say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And that somehow that makes you holy? He says, go look at Shiloh. Now, Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle was set up in the book of Joshua. And that place was obliterated. And God says, you want to think about holy land when it comes to me? You think you can live however you want to? And that I'm going to bless you just because there's a temple there with my name on it? Go look at Shiloh. That place is gone. And that's where my presence was supposed to have been before. I'm not going to be with you if you're a wicked people. And so here we are in Babylon. God appears before Ezekiel, and he's got a call for him. Well, I tell you what, you want to learn a lot about a group of people, a characteristics of a people, look at chapter 2. And he said unto me, Son of man, that's going to be the term that's used over and over in this book. And if you remember, that was Jesus' favorite term for himself. Stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. Imagine the God of heaven says, Ron Gilbert, or you fill in the blank, stand up. I'm going to talk to you. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet. And I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel. Here's the call. To a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. And he is going to take Ezekiel later on literally uh, figuratively, literally, how does that make sense, in this vision by the hair of the head and take him back to the temple and say, look at what's going on in here. Right now, God is saying, the people of Israel are, working, are worshiping pagan gods in the temple they built unto me. And I'm not going to put up with it. He says, they've rebelled, their fathers have rebelled, and they're doing it right even to right now. Verse 4, for they are impotent children and stiff-hearted. The idea that they're hard-hearted, that they've got their mind set on what they think's right, and they're not going to let anybody change them. Jesus is going to say the same thing about them, from Abel to his righteous servant, Zechariah, who was killed before the temple. All the prophets that were sent to him, they killed them because they're a stiff-hearted and a stiff-necked people. Same thing Stephen will say to them right before they kill him in Acts chapter 7. He says, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Ko Amar Adonai, there you know some Hebrew. Thus saith the Lord God. This is God speaking, not me speaking, Ezekiel saying, verse 5. And they, whether they will hear, that word Shema, or whether they will forbear, in other words, they don't pay attention. Quotes, uh, you know, parenthetical statement, for their rebellious house. God says, whether they'll hear you or whether they won't. It's their attitude, they're usually rebellious. rebellious. Yet, shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. Brethren, that's our job. Boom, right there, huh? To do what? Sow the seed. What are you? You're a seed sower. You're a preacher of the word. You're a teacher of the gospel. You're to go out and preach the gospel to everybody to listen. You tell them about Jesus. What happens if they don't hear? Hey, they'll know that there's been a prophet among them. God never told us. 
Now, you need to go out there and convert people. It is your responsibility to convert them. You got to latch on to them, you know, like a legion. Don't turn loose till you get them in the water. No. God says you preach. You teach. And here we see one of the things that Ezekiel is, is, is supposed to do. You go to them. Whether they'll hear you or whether they won't hear you, when they stand before me one day in judgment, I can say, there was a prophet among you. You knew the truth, and you chose not to obey it. You see, that's one of the reasons we do what we do. God has already told us, many are called, few are chosen. I was talking about people that actually accept the word. God has already told us that there will be many in that day that are going to be lost, few that are saved, Matthew 7, 13, and 14. Yet what does he tell me and you do? Preach. You preach the word. You're not responsible for the soil. You're the seed caster. You do your job. The word's going to do its job, and people will have opportunity to obey it or to be like Israel and just throw it aside. But, hey, they will know that there's been a prophet among them. Verse 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou doest dwell among scorpions. In other words, it's going to be hard. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. God said, I'm with you. I got you back here. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I look, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. Remind you of anything? Remind you of Zechariah? Sure enough. There was a book therein, and he spread it before me, and was written within, without both sides. And there was within, written within, lamentations. That's something you cry over. You ever read the book of Lamentations? Oh, it is sad. It is so sad. You can see why they called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. He said, that's what's written in this book. Mourning. Sadness. You're upset about something bad that's happened. Something bad that's going to happen. Lamentations, mourning, and woe. Woe, woe, woe. Alas, bad, not good. That's what's in this book. Verse 11, uh, verse, uh, 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 did I skip something there? I sure did not, but I tell you what, if you have your Bibles, let me go ahead and read over into this. He's going to make him eat that. I better stop right here. We'll just go over for this week. We'll start back chapter 3, verse 1 next week. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat thou, thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll. There is your calling of the prophet of Ezekiel. The words have been put into Ezekiel. And now he is going to be uh, preaching them back, if you will. If you don't get anything out of this lesson, we're going to, uh, uh, rest of chapter 3 also is a part of his call. He's going to be told exactly some of the specifics of his uh, mission. But if you don't get anything out of tonight's lesson, other than just, just remember the vision, the painting, the word picture that Ezekiel is trying to draw for you. Because that's what you're going to find in the book of Revelation. Symbology, pictures, word pictures, things, uh, you know, sometimes entire chapter. Where we get beat up, where we find ourselves getting into trouble, and hey, this is what we do because we're Bible students, right, is that we try to take every word and get a specific meaning out of it. And so, you know, we, we argue about, you know, the preposition I is in Acts 2.38, for the remission of sins, and we'll write whole books about how this word is used in this particular. You can't do that with apocalyptic literature. It's just not meant to. It is to paint a huge picture. Now, we don't know what the, uh, the specifics of the four faces and what their exact symbology is. What you're supposed to walk away from chapter 1 with is the fact that God is awesome and that Ezekiel saw him and that God spoke to him, and here's what he has said to him. So if you ever get tired, you ever get upset, and you're, you're wondering, you know, think about chapter 1. Think about Isaiah's heaven vision. Think about Revelations chapter 4 and 5, and think about you one day standing in the very throne room of God, standing before God to give an account of the things done in this life, whether they be good or bad. Think about it now. Think about what Ezekiel has tried to draw, and think about the awesomeness, the power of God when he is going to say, welcome, my beloved, son, or depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew. It's real. It is real, and we will all be there 
one day. And then there'll be no guesswork about how powerful God is or how strong he is or whether he knew I did this or did that or no. Uh, at the end of our life, our works here will be done. with be night. We can't work anymore. We can't change anything. That's why it's important that we understand and, and do things in this side of eternity to affect our soul's salvation. If you're not a child of God, that day you will want to be. The day to fix that is today. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You want to be prepared to be with uh, God's children on that day and stand on the side of the redeemed. A lot of times, as children of God, we can forget about that vision. We can be like poor Ezekiel there, and we're trudging, you know, day in, day out, trying to get this hard-hearted generation that we live amongst to hear us, to believe that there's a Jesus the Christ, that you ought to be good to your neighbors, that we all not lie to one another, that we ought to hold the people accountable for crimes and things of this nature, that there is right and that there is wrong, and it's legitimate, and it's not gray, it's black and white. This is right. This is wrong. And you'll get tired. You'll say, sometimes you may think, maybe, maybe it's not right. Maybe, maybe I think about God. And all of this is what God has put together to see how you, I, our neighbors, our friends will react. He wants to know whether you love him or you love the world. If you're here tonight, we can help you at all. We encourage you to come as you stand and sing. Amen.